So they took the Hebrew music of, of the synagogue and they, we could say they recast it, reformed it in the Greek or Latin languages and they grouped the melodies of the chants into eight groups that are called the eight tones. Now, uh, why, why are there eight and why are, there, why are there not seven or sixteen? Well, there's a number of explanations for that, some of them technical, but I'm going to tell you only one tonight. They did it because they had a great love for, for there being uh, eight. You know, that's the same reason they call the Lord's Day the eighth day. See, eight is the sign of that which is beyond this world. If there are seven days in the week, as we have said, then what the Lord brings us, the, etern- the eternity that he brings us in his resurrection is the, uh, we could say, the invasion or the, or the eruption in time of the eternal life. So that's why they like to call uh, the Lord's Day the eighth day. There is in one of the ancient, ancient Christian churches in Ravenna in Italy uh, a beautiful mosaic that shows Christ as the Lamb of God, glorified, slain but yet living, as he appeared in the book of Revelation. And he is surrounded by the sun and the moon and the stars, and around him are eight bunches of fruit. And that those eight bunches of fruit is a, a sign in, in, in art of the eternal life. There's that, the early Christians built their baptismal fonts having eight sides. They, they loved that. And so likewise, when they, when they organized the, the melodies for singing the psalms and the hymns, they organized, they organized them in groups of eight, and we call those, those groups of eight the eight tones. And beginning every year at, at Easter, we count the Sundays in groups of eight until we get, we get to Easter again, and we start all over again from one till eight. So it's this, it's this passing through each year, uh, from Easter to Easter, from Sunday to Sunday, through all these cycles of prayer, that the church experiences in time the grace of the eternal life. Until time passes away, it is what's been given to us as our most essential work. Our, that's why liturgy means work, the public work. The most ex- essential expression of the church's life is this taking the passing of time, days and weeks and months and years, and making it holy by participating in the prayers of the church. Now, you might have noticed that uh, the greatest of the church's services, the Holy Eucharist, the divine liturgy, it's not included, uh, strictly speaking, in the listing of, of the services of time. And that's because it's always understood that it is in the Eucharist that we are taken beyond time. When we partake in the divine liturgy of the body and blood of the Lord, we really, though invisibly and spiritually, we really leave This world, we're going to speak a great deal about this in in the time to come, and we go to be with Christ at his table, at his kingdom. We are called to join the heavenly church at the divine liturgy. The, The church in heaven and the church on earth become one. The saints are present with us. The mother of God is present with us. The Lord himself comes to be present with us in the Holy Eucharist, and so takes us beyond time and gives us a taste of uh, that time when there will be no more time, if we can speak in those terms, of, of entering into the eternity of the life of communion with him that we that he invites us to share forever and ever. So my hope is that this evening will begin. It's only a very, uh, uh, a very sketchy beginning in outline form to familiarize you with the cycles of the church's prayer, to make you more aware of what's going on in the church day by day, week by week, as, as the liturgical services of the church are, are observed, and to encourage you as most central to, to your growing in Orthodox life to take advantage of of the ongoing prayer of the church as as best you are able and and as much as you are willing. And hopefully, by the grace of the Spirit working in us all, we are all more and more willing and desiring to to be fed and defined by this life of prayer which keeps the church going until time passes away. So we'll close and 
with that, and then we can uh, have some questions. Can you mention again? Can you mention again the name of that uh, Compton or Com Compline? It's spelled C O M P L I N E. This is the service before bed. Brief, brief service before bed. It's you don't often find it done in parish churches. You, you'll find it done much more commonly in monasteries. We do it a few times a year. We do it especially during the first week of Lent where it has a special form for the first week of Lent. Sometimes, though, and here's another thing that can be said, uh, as people become more and more familiar by exposing themselves to, to uh, the, the daily and weekly services of the church, uh, many times Christian people, when they cannot when they cannot take part in the services of the church, or, or even when the services are not available, they try to, to model uh, their prayers at home on some of the services of the church. And there are helps to, uh, to, to do that. I, I, think, I think for those first experiencing the, the liturgy of the church, it's best to wait a little bit for that. But as you become more and more familiar with it, you might want to take advantage of, of some of those things. Another question. Uh, what evidence do we have in the in the early early church, the first two or three centuries, of this cycle of the church's worship being developed? Or is it is it in a seed state at that time and develops more as the church grows? The content of the services can be said to develop. Of course, uh, from the beginning, uh, the church did not have, for example, all of this hymnography that we, that we do. This was composed by, by the great saints from generation to generation. But the services themselves, just as we know they were held in the, in the Old Testament, were held by the Christian people from the beginning. If one reads, for example, uh, the lives of the, uh, the writings of the apostolic fathers or, or some of the writings of, of the the uh, early martyrs of the church, there is constant reference made to the hours of prayer, to the evening and morning prayers, to keeping the hours throughout the day. In fact, uh, the, I'll, I'll give two examples that come to mind. Uh, uh, third century Christian writer uh, in North Africa named Tertullian. Uh, was writing some advice. He, he's, he's, he was expressing disapproval for, uh, for a Christian to, to marry a non-believer. And he says, uh, what is your non-believing husband or wife going to say to you when you're constantly going off to prayer? And then, then he says, in fact, he says about the, if the woman is, is a believer and her husband is a non-believer, he says, one of the troubles you're going to have is your husband will not allow you to go off to vigil in the middle of the night. <laughs> So you see, already there you have in, in the third century, even during the period of persecution, there's all of this in place. But one book that I would recommend to you especially, because it, it deals with this most exactly, as I've referred to it before, is it is a journal that was written in the fourth century by a Spanish lady that her name was Agaria. She came from Spain to... Uh, to the Holy Land, toured all the holy places after the persecution had ended. And she wrote this journal that's called Agaria's Travels. Now, I noticed it's been for the last several years very, very difficult to obtain, but I noticed that the bookstore does have a couple copies of it. It's not, it, it's not the translation that I think is the best one, but still it is available. And I would recommend anybody who is seriously interested in seeing, uh, I know that, that we had some, uh, the first time, for example, our, our pastor, Father Weldon, read it here, and I know Jim read it. It's incredible, the, the experience of seeing that what we do now, how much of it is precisely in place as early in the fourth century, as the fourth century. And even when they talk about it then, they talk about it as something that's been around for a long time. Uh, the hymn that we sing every evening at Vespers, Joyful Light. Saint Basil the Great writes about that hymn in, in the fourth century, and he, and already there he says, it's so old, nobody knows when it started. See, it's, 
That's why uh, it, it's good to have the awareness that when we come to the services of the church, we're doing something that Christians have, have done from the beginning, and even for the most part, in the words of the Psalms and in the early hymns of the church, we're, we're on our mouths. We said this about the Lord's Prayer last week, that we have, we have the consolation when we pray the Lord's Prayer of, of uh, praying the words of the Lord, the same words that have been around for 2,000 years. But also in the services of the church, we have much of that too. Yes, Ellen, and then Les. Okay, when we, when you were talking about the sacraments and you were talking about the sacrament of marriage, if a couple was married, say, by a justice of the peace, what does that mean in the church? I, I assume that you mean that a couple outside the church were married by, by the justice of the peace. So part of the right, church. right. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's the practice of the church that we receive people in the state of life that they are. So, for example, when, and, and we're going to talk about this more in detail later, when, when someone is, is uh, baptized or chrismated in the church, that also, if they are married people, that also is the church's blessing on their marriage. See, we don't repeat the marriage. Uh, it's... Though there have been some, there are some occasions in the life of the church where people have come in from outside the church and they have requested for, for the, the sacramental marriage of the church to be done for them. And, and, uh, sometimes, sometimes, uh, we, we do that. But it's, it's not something that the church assumes. Rather, if, if two married people come into the church as married people, their marriage is sanctified by their being united to the church through baptism or chrismation. Unless. Father David, you mentioned tonight confessors. I couldn't make it last time. And I wondered if I missed uh, confession and absolution, or is it coming up in the future? Oh, no. Uh, the class on confession will be coming up. And it's it, because we have to have uh, classes that deal with all of the sacraments. And especially for all of those preparing to be received into the church, of course, the, the, what's done before we come for baptism or chrismation, the essential part of preparing for that is, is the first confession. And we'll spend a great deal of care and time on, on preparing for that. Last, last time we spoke of the traditional understanding in the church of the Lord's Prayer. Father David, you mentioned that uh, briefly that this thing of fasting on Wednesday and Friday, go back to the time of the apostles, uh, what evidence is there of that? There is, I've referred to this writing uh, before, there is a first century writing of the church that is called the Didache. Didache means 12. It means the teaching of the 12 apostles. And one of the things that's written there in the Didache, it gives a, a rather developed uh, kind of code of life for Christians, both moral code and also uh, expressions of the sanctification of life and, and of time. And it even gives uh, an example of, of some early Christian liturgical prayers that are given there in full. And one of the things it says, it, uh, it refers to the practice of fasting twice a week. Now, how do we know that was a common practice even in Israel? Because it was one of the things the Pharisee brags about in the parable of Jesus in the, in the gospel about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Pharisee uh, is bragging that he does everything that he's supposed to. He, he does it very well. Uh, he, he gives all his tithes. He, he does not uh, engage in serious sin. Uh, and he, he, and he fasts twice a week, and isn't he wonderful? Uh, but what we gain by reading that, a lot of things we gain, but the, the practice of, uh, of fasting twice a week, again, I'm going to spend the whole evening on the discipline of fasting, so I won't speak on that aspect of it now. This first century uh, writing, the Didache, says, let your fast days be every week, talking to the Christian people, on Wednesday and Friday. Because on Wednesday, the Lord was betrayed by Judas. It was on Wednesday that Judas made the agreement to, to betray Jesus for the 30 pieces of silver. And on Friday, he was crucified and died. So let your fasting be on these days as, as a participation in the sufferings of Christ. So... So that's one place. Another place, uh, that's the first century from the very beginning. Then there are other uh, Christian writings uh, from, from the early centuries. One is called the Shepherd of Hermas. 
And that is a collection of, of visions and parables uh, that comes from the second century that was considered uh, to be, uh, by some of the early Christians even, they wanted to have it included in the Bible. And finally, when they decided what was going to be in the Bible, the, the council said, no, it wasn't written by, it's not apostolic. It doesn't have an apostolic author, but it's a, a very, it's a very good, good book, but we can't include it in the canon of scripture. And one of, one of the things that's referred to in the Shepherd of Hermas are what are called the station days. And the station days in the early church, a, a station in the, it's a term, term taken from the, uh, the Roman military. Uh, terminology that it's a period a period of sentry duty and the the uh, early Christians meant it to refer to a period of fasting period of intensified prayer and fasting and again it's the same thing the Wednesday and Friday station days then there's one I'll give you just a little preview of what's to come something that I like very much when I when I teach about the Wednesday and Friday fasts and how seriously they were taken in the, in the early church is uh one of the early bishops of, of the church that was t- being taken to his martyrdom saint uh, has a kind of resounding name saint fructuosus of terragana in in spain was being taken to his mar, uh, was being taken to his martyrdom taken to be uh, to be executed for Christ's sake and it was friday and uh and so they're offering him uh something something to drink uh before before uh his his execution and he said no i i will not have it because it is not yet the hour to break the fast and on this day i will break my fast in heaven <laughs> So, and that's only, uh, so those three, there, there are many other, uh, many other references to in, in the, what we call the, you know, in the sources of the church tradition that, that continually insist that, that the weekly fasts are of, are of apostolic origin. And then I think it was Linda I had a question. Why do we sing the Lord's Prayer and the Nicene Creed? The reason why we sing the Lord's Prayer and the Nicene Creed at the Divine Liturgy is it, it, actually that's a question that that is p- uh, part of a larger question. It's for the same reason that we sing almost everything at the liturgical services. That traditionally in the church, and here we speak both of the Church of the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is the most common practice that the best expression of the human voice for the worship of God is not uh, the ordinary speaking that we have, but rather a higher form, and that is singing or chanting. That we take, we take uh, the, the greatest of our gifts, as, as sometimes it's called the gift of speech, and elevate it to its highest form, which is the form of song. So the Lord's Prayer and the Creed traditionally were sung in the church, though, though in some places you find them said, and it's what we did here for a long time till, till we learned to sing them. But for the same reason that we sing the Psalms, the same reason that we sing the hymns, that the uniting of, of the voices of the assembly in, with the expression of song, of chant has been experienced in the church as the best means of of uh, of offering this this praise and prayer to God, and even the creed there, because uh, sometimes people think, well, is, isn't the creed uh, a declaration of faith? Why would you turn it into a song? But the creed is an act of praise. The creed is not simply, it begins with being a statement of faith, but also the creed is is a glorification of, of, of the Lord who reveals himself through the incarnation and the redemption in those words. It's a, it's, uh, to, to, uh, to sing the creed is to celebrate the triumph uh, of, of the faith in our lives. Yes, Richard. There's a question that just keeps bobbing in my mind, and I'm almost fearful to ask it because it sounds sacrilegious. How were the early Christians to work if they were to be involved in as much of the work of service? Mm-hmm. Well, of course, they they had to work uh, as uh, in the same way that 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 people have to work now, though. Uh, you know, the, the kind of, uh, nine to five or eight to four schedule that a lot of people now uh, are, are bound to, uh, as contrasted to the, the more, uh, agrarian and even relaxed, 
uh, kind of daily schedule that you find that you find even now uh, in other places of the world. Uh, we've we've kind of uh, really taken to its extreme this uh, this uh, freezing of, of of the daily schedule, but. They they took part in the public ch- worship of the church to the extent that they were able. That's it's always, especially on, on the working days. We we I don't think we could ever assume that that uh, the members of the church took took part in the liturgy of the church to the same extent that they did on Sunday on ordinary weekdays. They tried to do what they could. Uh, and it's interesting that, that you find it often expressed that they look forward to that time in their lives when they would be more able, able. Uh, because frequently it's, it's not possible either for people who, who, uh, who, who work or for people who even have uh, obligations with small children, uh, to, to be at as many of the services as they would like to. But nevertheless, it's, it's that desire and and the the experience of the church that this ongoing prayer they were continually in the temple praising and blessing god that's why even here if you you come to the services on the weekdays especially at certain times of the year there sometimes even aren't that many people but that isn't even the most important thing the most important thing is that this expression of the church's prayer goes on and is available and and we try to take part in it as our uh, to the extent that our state in life allows us. That's... But but of course the understanding has been that there are some things that everybody takes part in, and, and that means primarily uh, the services of the Lord's Day and the great feast days and and certain other things also that we'll mention as as the weeks go on. We speak more of these things. This idea of sacrament, making God known, there's a lot of, in, and you said specifically what some of those things were, there's some very mundane things uh, in life that, that we may, uh, like, for example, smelling a flower or eating a meal, or this could be something that the realization would come and, uh, and would make God known to us. Would that be considered sacramental yes those things yes the saints would tell us that if we are really uh to use just an ordinary phrase if we're really in tune with god if our mind and heart are focused on god everything becomes sacramental everything becomes transfigured the everything in the world uh, every thought every act everything that we see every encounter that we have uh with, with someone that's why uh one of the greatest of the of the of the contemporary saints of the church, Saint Seraphim over there, that shown that shown in the white, who was frequently seen. Uh, so he he is one of those that that attained what we would call uh, union with God while still still in this life. And people would see him. We have their testimony uh, shining with 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 the light of the transfigured Christ. And he would greet everybody that would come to see him with the words, "Oh my joy, Christ is risen," and that's how, that's how it's meant to become for each one of us, that, that through everything, uh, God, God reveals himself. God, God uh, is reflected. Everything, everything leads us to God, everything in creation, every person, every situation, especially the crosses. If we walk in the way of the saints, that's what we find. But we will, when we speak uh, particularly about the Eucharist in detail, We'll talk about how how uh, these these material things how how they serve to be the means of of God revealing Himself to us, and and what that means exactly. Well, if that's all, we'll we'll conclude for the evening. Remind you that, that next week there is no class. Uh, I'll be going to the. Uh, the uh, Council of Priests. In fact, I'm leaving early tomorrow morning in, in Nashville, Tennessee, and because uh, that finishes on Sunday, but because my brother lives not far from there and I haven't gotten to see him for a while, I'm going to go spend a few days with my brother and his family. So so next, next week we'll have a week off and then we'll resume two weeks uh, from tonight. So uh, before we go, let's, let's stand and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen.